Good morning and welcome to Gospel Center Missionary Church. I'm Pastor Ben and I have your morning announcements. First of all, just want to thank you all for joining us today. Whether you're in-house or you're at home online, we are just so grateful that you've decided to join us. And we really want to hear from you. So if you're in-house, fill out a Connect card today. Let us know how we can pray for you, how we can be there for you, or if you're new with us. Also, online at www.gcmc.info, under the Engage tab, you can cl click Connect. And there, you can fill out prayer requests, let us know who you are, how we can connect with you. Another awesome, great opportunity under the Engage tab is the River Park Trunk or Treat happening October 25th. Now, this is going to be a unique event as we socially distance for Trunk or Treat. I would encourage you to visit the website so you can see the details of that and find out ways that you can sign up, get updates on the Facebook page, and be a part of what Gospel Center is doing. Additionally, we want to encourage everyone today to get connected to a Sunday school class or a small group. There's many wonderful people who want to get to know you and walk with you in your spiritual journey. So let us know today how we can help you get connected to the body of Christ through Sunday school or small groups. Also, Children's Church is going to be dismissed today after the pastoral prayer. So if you have the little ones that can go and be a part of that today, we would encourage you to watch for after the pastoral prayer and dismiss your kids so that they can continue their worship. Other than that, we are so grateful that you're here, and I now want to invite you to stand as we sing and worship our Lord together. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good morning, church. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You Be set free. Oh, 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Scripture reading today comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was the firstborn, but when he defiled his father's marriage bed, his rights as firstborn were given to the sons of Joseph, son of Israel. So he could not be listed in the genealogical record in accordance with the birthright. And through Judah, and though Judah was the strongest of the brothers and the ruler came from him, the rights of the firstborn belonged to Joseph. God's word tells us to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you want to do God's will, right? So if you want to do God's will, then you need to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And so whether you're here today in our sanctuary, if you're watching online, as we go to prayer this morning, keep those three things in mind. To rejoice evermore, to pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Do you have a reason to be thankful today? Is there a reason to rejoice today? Do you have a reason to pray today? So let's go and do that right now. Let's pray together. Today, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that uh, there's nothing you can't do. We've already sung about your amazing grace, and we've sung about there's <clears throat> nothing can stand against you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would bless us now as we come to you, first of all, rejoicing, thanking you for who you are. You're the God of the universe. 
You created every single thing that was created. Nothing was created without you. And so we thank you for all that. We thank you for life. We thank you for um, abundant life. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you, Lord, that you want to be in our lives and lead us and guide us and direct us and bless us time after time after time. So today, Lord, we do thank you for that. But we have requests, Lord, where requests that we need to make to you. We're thinking of Bobby Plummer this morning. As he's probably um, just coming out of surgery, maybe just preparing for surgery down in Indianapolis, we pray, Lord, that you would bless him. We pray that you would touch his body, heal his body. We pray that you would bless Jake and Gail as they care for him. We pray that you'd also be with, uh, with uh, Elizabeth and Mark as they, both have, uh, as they both have physical needs and Mark has spiritual needs. We pray that you would bless in that situation. We pray that you would bless Bob as he's recovering from pneumonia. We pray that you would just keep your hand upon him. We pray that you would bless Greg and Bambi with their physical needs. I pray that you'd be with Ron Applegate, Lord, as he's, um, as he's suffering right now. We pray that you would bless him, bless Beth as she cares for him, watch over them. We pray that today, Lord, that you would be with our children. We recognize that they're going to be the leaders of the church in the next generation. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us work through us as we raise them to love and serve you. We thank you for the, those who will be leading our children today. We pray that you would bless them as well. We thank you for our youth. Some are here on the platform. Many are sitting there in the sanctuary. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up our youth to be godly leaders in their schools, in their communities, in our church. Continue to bless their leaders as well. We pray that you would be with our missionaries that are scattered around the world today, serving you in places that we'll never go, but we're called to go. And so we pray, Lord, that you would use them on our behalf to reach people for Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, today that you would bless Pastor John as he comes to share from your word. We pray, Lord, that you help us each to take, get something today that we can take out of here to use in the week ahead. So we just thank you and praise you. We, we do rejoice today. We pray to you, Lord, and we give you thanks for all you've done, all you're doing, and what you're yet to do. We thank you and love you, and thank you for your great love for us. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship the mighty God we serve? Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations Savior, he can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Yes, I surrender. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. 
Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. sanctuary or at home on live stream would you pray with me the prayers can be on the screen show me your ways O lord teach me your paths guide me in your truth and teach me for you are god my savior and my hope is in you all day long amen well reach down and grab your bibles or your phones or tablets and open them to the book of genesis chapter 37 as we continue the series we started last sunday um, on the life of joseph and today we find ourselves in Genesis 37, verses 5 through 11 is what we'll be reading. As you turn there. So Genesis 37, verses 5 through 11. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. 
while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Amen. You may be seated. Christians don't always have the right response to God's word. There is a Peanuts comic strip, you know the one with Charlie Brown? From years ago, there was a comic strip in Peanuts where Lucy, you see her pacing around in frustration. She's trying to remember her Bible memory verse, and she's trying to remember the words and the reference, and she's not coming up with it. And finally, in the last frame of the little comic strip, she blurts out, well, I think it's from the book of reevaluation. Well, sometimes that's what the Bible's supposed to do for us, to help us reevaluate. And today, God wants to help us reevaluate our approach to Scripture, to look at the way that that we use Scripture in our own lives and if we use Scripture in our own lives. And so to do that, I want to look at the biblical characters in this story because they have received God's revelation through a dream that Joseph has. And each of them, Joseph, his brothers, and his father, have a different response to this revelation from God in this dream. And I think it could be instructive for us on how we respond to God's revelation in our lives. And so, let's answer the question, how did the biblical characters respond to God's revelation? And then let's look at that and make the same stance for us. Look, what would that mean in our lives and our response to God's revelation? And so, the first question is, how did the biblical characters respond to God's revelation? Now, just to provide the context, remember, Joseph has had two dreams. But even before this, we saw last week that Joseph comes from one very dysfunctional family, and a family that has been dysfunctional for generations. And not only does he come from a dysfunctional family, but within his family, the more pertinent information is what we saw in the verses when we started at verse 1 last week, went through verse 4, that his brothers hate him. Joseph's brothers, they cannot stand him for a couple reasons. One is we saw that he was a tattletale when uh, they were out in the fields watching the sheep, he went back and told his father what was going on. We don't know what those details are. Scripture doesn't tell us, but we know that he tattled on them. The other thing is that his father loved him more than all of his other brothers, and he had a, a large family. It would be a total of 12, um, but he has a large family, and his father loved him the most, and his father gave him what in Sunday school class we call the coat, a robe of many colors, showing his prestige within the lineup of the family. And so the brothers hate him and are jealous of him. And now we get to two dreams. The first dream is a dream about sheaves. And so they're out in the grain fields, and Joseph's sheaf stands up, and the sheaves of his brothers bow down. And they honor him as somehow being in charge and honoring his position of authority over them. And, of course, they're furious about that. Um, And... In the second dream, we have the sun, the moon, and the stars. So now we've expanded it. It's not just the brothers. Now it's the family and parents included bowing down to Joseph. And the reason there's two dreams is significant. It doesn't tell us in this passage, but as we read on through the story, we're going to find out that eventually Joseph's going to land up in Egypt. Um, Pharaoh's going to have two dreams. And Joseph explains why there's two dreams when we get to chapter 41, verse 32. He says, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And so Joseph has two dreams, and that's significant because God is showing them, and we don't know it at this point, but God is showing them he's decided this is what's going to happen. And he's not only has he shown them what's going to happen, but he's foreshadowing that somewhere 
And we've all, many of us have already read this story. We know where the story of Joseph goes. It's no surprise to us. It's like watching a movie a dozen times, and, and we, we, we know the plot line. So no surprises. But if you'd never read the story, you're thinking, okay, so here's a brother who's hated. And coming through it the first time, now he has a dream that somehow all his brothers are going to bow down to him. How are we going to get from being hated to the place where they are bowing down and recognizing his position of authority? And it foreshadows what's going to happen as the story progresses and how we'll get there. And so, Joseph has two dreams. Those dreams, it doesn't say they're from God, but we know that they reveal God's plan and his will, what's going to happen in his lives. So we could call them God's revelation. In other words, God is revealing what he is going to do in and through Joseph's life and in his broader family. And so, he reveals that. My question is, how did the different characters, Joseph, his brothers, and his father, respond to that revelation. So let's start with Joseph. If I had to choose a word to describe his response to God's revelation, I would choose the word pride. Now some thinks he's just going ahead and telling his brothers what's going on, um, but it seems that not only does he lack tact, but he seems quite happy to share with him the future role that he sees himself having within the family. And so we might say that he has pride. In verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. You're thinking, man, if your brothers don't like you, if they hate your guts, and you've had a dream that they're all going to bow down to you, you think, you might just want to keep that to yourself until it happens. But not Joseph. Joseph, listen to this dream I had. And if that isn't enough, when God sends a second dream to confirm what he's going to do, then he says in verse 9, he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And they're thinking, oh, great. Joseph, Joseph, maybe, maybe a little bit of pride in what he sees his role to be in the family and the future. And so we see Joseph's response to God's revelation is one of pride. Now, the brothers, I would say their response is one of anger. In fact, you'll find that it builds and builds. Um, they're already angry with him if we were to go back and read verses 1 through 4. But beginning in this passage, verse 5, it says, Joseph had a dream when he told it to his brothers. They hated him all the more. They already hated him. They hated him because he was a tattletale. They hated him because he was dad's favorite. They hated him for, for the, the special place he had in his dad's heart. And now they hate him even more. It goes on in verse 8. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. So notice, they don't just hate him. There's something interesting here. It says they hated him because of his dream. They even hate the dream he had. They hate what God has revealed. They hate that, that they have this picture of them somehow honoring this despised brother. So they hate their brother, and they hate the dream that God has given them. And it goes on to verse 11. It says, his brothers, in verse 11, were jealous of him. This is an envy so great that it's liable to spill over into violent action, which we see, as we will read on in the story. And so they are jealous of him. And they are angry at him, and they were angry about the dream that God has given him twice but they're not the only ones. There's a third character, and that is the father, Jacob. And Jacob's word, I, I choose one word. I chose the word humility, although in my, in my notes I have in brackets next to that that it is a strained humility. Because even Jacob, when he hears about it in verse 10, when, his father, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Now, at this point, he must be looking at his son thinking, Son, I love you. You're my favorite, but let's get real for a moment. We're not going to go this far. Uh, your mom and I are not bowing down before you. And maybe he's okay with the brothers bowing down. It doesn't say. We just realize that even dad thinks it's gone too far. But it doesn't end there. There's a little phrase at the end. His brothers were jealous of him, but... His father kept the matter in mind. Jacob's not a young man anymore. He's wisened up over the years. And 
He's had a dream himself. You remember when he's running from Esau and he lays down one night? If we read earlier in the book of Genesis, he lays down one night, uses a rock as his pillow, and as he goes to sleep, he sees a stairway from heaven with angels ascending and descending on the stairway from heaven. And he says, I, surely I did not realize that the presence of God was in this place. And Jacob's had a dream. Jacob knows that God has spoken to his, his father and his grandfather. Jacob knows that God is at work in their family. And when Jacob hears that there's two dreams, he doesn't say anything, he doesn't affirm it, he's not necessarily happy about what the dream shows, at least not the part that includes him um, himself, but, but Jacob, he tucks it away in the back of his mind, and it, I have to think that he's wondering, is this from God? What has God got planned? And so he has, even though he has some disagreement with the dream on the front end, he has humility on the back end to say, this may very well be the hand of God at work. So that's how the three respond to God's revelation. My question is, how do we respond to God's revelation? Now, you might say, well, I've never had a dream from God that was repeated in two different ways, and surely not with people bowing down to me, never had such aspirations. I realize that. As we look at the Bible, we see God at times in people's lives doing miraculous things and revealing himself in miraculous ways, and I don't deny that God can give dreams. I've mentioned before in services that it's been reported in the Middle East and other Muslim countries that that God has uh, appeared to them, to Muslims, in a vision that they could see that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and come to faith in Him. And so we still have reports today at spots in the world where God gives dreams. But I would say that they're rare, just like they're rare even in the Bible. Think, J Joseph has a dream. We're not talking about anybody else in the whole planet Earth at that moment having a dream, just Joseph. So it seems a rare way, but there's a common way God has revealed Himself to us. And that's the Bible. The Bible is God's word to us. It is his revelation, his revealing of who he is and his plan of salvation for humanity to us. And my question is, do we respond in the same way about God's plan of revelation in the Bible as they did in the Old Testament? Do we come at God's revelation with the same attitudes? So, for example, I said Joseph seems to come with, away from these two dreams with a sense of pride. He's going to be ruler over his brothers, and he is glad to let them know that. Sometimes Christians come to the Bible with a sense of pride. Oh, we believe it. We, we believe it's absolutely true. It's the Word of God. And because of that, sometimes we have it as a sense of pride. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, let me give you some examples. Some of us we have the Bible as our badge of spirituality. The, uh, when I was younger, I think it was a little bit more common than it is today, and part of that's because I think our biblical literacy has gone way down. We don't, we don't talk about the Bible and engage with the Bible as much as we used to in our culture, but, um, but sometimes you would see people who, they knew a lot about the Bible and they loved the Bible, but did you ever walk in the church and find somebody who, they wanted everybody in the church to know how much they knew about the Bible and how much they loved the Bible. And so uh, you'd see them proudly. And, and, I, and I've carried my Bible like this, almost like a baseball glove when I'm running in from a, a ball game. But uh, they carry the Bible up in front of them as if it's their badge before them. And I carry my Bible this way sometimes. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. And, but some people, you know, they get a big, big Bible. And I have, a big, I have several big study Bibles back uh, in my office. I don't use them on Sundays because they're too hard to flip through and to carry around. Um, so I use a preaching Bible on Sunday, but, uh, but, but we carry the Bible around, and not only do we carry our Bibles, but we carry it for everybody to see, and then when it comes time to speak, we make sure that everybody knows that we know the Bible. You know, we quote it back and forth, not because we're helping out, but because we're showing off. And I have to confess, as a pastor, I've done that many times on my own. Uh, as an example, I had to take Hebrew when I went to Bethel College and study Hebrew, I wish I remembered Hebrew. I don't. Um, it reads backwards, and I can tell you lots of letters. I could probably sound it out, but to remember what the words mean, I don't remember. And that frustrates me. I have what, some of you probably have a brain like mine. It goes in, and it just slowly leaks out the backside. You know what I mean? A lot of, a lot of what you learn. And, and you just wish it would all stay in there. And that's what always impressed me about professors. It seems like it all stayed in there. I'm like, how did they do that? How did they get it to all stay in there? But my brain doesn't work that way. But 
I had to memorize a verse in Hebrew. And so I found myself, whenever I'm, I'm preaching and I get to the verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, called the Shema, I'm like, I'll say that in Hebrew. Does it benefit anybody in the congregation for me to say it in Hebrew? Not really. You know what benefit it has? It makes me look smart. Yeah. Sometimes that's what we do with God's word. We know a whole bunch of Bible verses. We, we quote them. We stack them up. We, we're, we're quick. And I'm not saying we should memorize the Bible. We should be able to offer verses when they're helpful. We should be able to give answers in a Sunday school class when an answer is given, and we should share our comments. But have you ever just met people? There's people who, who provide all of that as a desire to be helpful in a service and to share as part of a group. There's other people who do it as a desire to show off and to display their spiritual badge that they have and i think we have to just be careful we should always use scripture we should be quick to memorize it but we should be careful to never wear it as a badge of spirituality scripture after all is god's gift to us sometimes we also use it as in pride we use it as a weapon um we grab our Bible verses and we're quick to defend. And I don't know that this happens as much in church anymore either, but it used to be churches were very defined by their theological distinctives. And so you had the churches, they were the Calvinists. You had the churches that were the Arminians. And you had, I mean, you have the churches, they have different end times views. They have different church polity views. They have all different types. And all, of all those churches, it used to be Christians were always ready with their set of verses, like there were a set of revolvers in their holster. It's like, if you want to argue over whether you're once saved, always saved, bring it on, buddy, because I got my verses ready to go. And I pull them out, and you remember this verse, and this verse, and that verse, and that verse, and you just start quoting them. And all of a sudden, you discover something about God's Word. No longer is it a conversation about, hey, what is what has God revealed to us? How do we wrestle with this and the differences and the difficulties? It instantly turns into, uh, we're at a battle, and let's use Bible verses as our weapon. They're like little darts that we throw into our brothers and sisters in Christ to beat them up. And to show them that we've got the truth and they better listen. And there's no, there's no conversation, no, no really trying to engage with one another about the truth. And so we have our weapon Bible verses that we pull out. And finally, sometimes we are in pride when we use the Bible as a pedestal. I wouldn't set my Bible on the floor and stand on top of it, but practically sometimes that's what we do. We use the Bible as a pedestal to show ourselves we've got the truth and the world is going to hell in a handbasket, as the saying goes, and we're glad to let them know that. And so we stand on our little pedestal of Bible truth while we don't care about the world. But that's not what we see in Scripture, is it? When Jesus had the truth and he comes marching into, comes riding a donkey, I should say, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and he sees the city and he realizes the city does not recognize the time of the Messiah's coming, it says he weeps over them. Christians are people who have the truth, but it's not to brag over the world. It's to weep that the world might come to know the truth. When the Apostle Paul, he debates with Pharisees, he would go into the synagogues and argue with them to show them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. We discover that he is quite the voracious arguer. He doesn't compromise truth at all, but he says in Romans, he says, I wish I was cut off if my brother's could be included in Christ. And so he has the truth, he holds the truth, he proclaims the truth, but he does so ultimately with the desire that those who don't know it might come to know it. Not because he wants to beat people up, because he wants them to be saved. And sometimes I think in the church, we get this holier-than-thou view towards the world, but we're not over the world, we are here as God's missionaries for the world to serve and to love them in prayer and tears that they will come to see the truth. And so we just have to watch out for spiritual pride. Joseph had the truth. He had two dreams from God. They're going to come true, aren't they? His family's going to show up in Egypt and bow down to him. He's got the truth, but he has pride with the truth to, to hold it in front of his brothers. And sometimes we have the truth, but the way we hold the word of God should not be in pride. As we'll see, we need to get to humility. Of course, Joseph's not the only one. 
His brothers, they receive the truth. They hear about the dreams. And their response is anger. Now, I don't know if Christians are angry about the Bible. I don't know if we would say that, that Christians get angry about what God has said. I notice this. It's more in the issue of avoidance. We, don't, we, we can't get angry. It's the Bible, after all. We can just dislike some parts and try to avoid them because they're not comfortable. So you see this. I, I, years ago, when I first graduated from Bethel, I went and served as a youth pastor at the Little General Baptist Church on McKinley in Osceola. And so I was there one Sunday. Pastor Lacey was the preaching pastor, and I was the youth pastor. And Pastor Lacey, he wrapped up a sermon. You know, they sang their closing song, and he came out to dismiss everybody. And he said, now before you go, he said, next Sunday, he said, I want you to know this. I'm going to be preaching a sermon on hell. He said, you'll want to hear what God has to say about hell. And uh, he prayed and dismissed everybody. So the next Sunday rolled around. And uh, he walked into the sanctuary, and I walked into the sanctuary, and we happened to be standing next to each other, and we looked around, and we realized half the church did not show up the next Sunday. Our attendance dropped in half. And he looked over at me, and he said, this is the last time I tell him what I'm preaching on the next Sunday. He knew why they all stayed home, because nobody wanted to hear about hell. And isn't that how it is with God's revelation? That there's things that God reveals that we're not comfortable with. We don't like to talk about. We'd rather not address. If we could just ignore those, avoid those, that would be wonderful. But as Christians, we have to realize that the Bible, all of it, from Genesis to Revelation, is God's counsel to us. And we can't avoid any of it. To be honest, pastors like to avoid Scripture. I don't enjoy preaching on money. It's just not fun. I realize people don't like to talk about money, and they feel like churches are always asking for money, and pastors are asking for money. So I just don't enjoy preaching on money. It's not something I, I enjoy doing. But it's in the Bible. In fact, some would say it's one of the most talked about topics um, by Jesus in the Gospels. Preaching on money. Another one, I don't enjoy when I get to the passages about divorce. I know so many people, your hearts have been hurt in broken marriages. And, and I've, I've had friends who they carry shame. There's, just, there's a lot of pain that comes with that. And so when we hit those passages, it just they're not comfortable topics because it's, it's like a doctor prodding, prodding around where there's pain and hurt, and you just don't enjoy that. And so I'd rather avoid that, but it's in God's word what he has to say about these things. There's those inconvenient commands, like we love the Ten Commandments, the do not steal, do not commit adultery, you know, do not murder, all right, we got that. Well, like, things like honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. There's those uncomfortable topics. It'll get any preacher in trouble when he says, Ephesians 5, 2 says, wives, submit to your husbands, and we talk about gender roles, and trying to understand that in a scriptural framework. Or what about 1 Corinthians 6, when it says, flee from sexual immorality, and we discover God's standards are different than our standards in this world. Or the exclusivity of Christianity, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. And we just realize, wow, that's not what most people think, and that's not a popular idea. Or you get to verses that challenge us. Like Leviticus 19, and 34, it says, When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And we just think, how does that apply to us? People down through history have struggled with the Bible. There's parts we want to avoid. In fact, Thomas Jefferson um, is known for taking the Bible, and they, it's affectionately called the Jefferson Bible, and he took the Gospels. And he took scissors and a razor blade, and he went through and cut out, they, this is what they say, the, the portions of the Gospels that he liked, which was the teachings of Jesus, but that he cut out all the miracles of Jesus because he did not believe in miracles. So the resurrection of Christ, the walking on water, turning, turning the water into wine, all the miracles cut out, and then he pasted into a, approximately a 66-page book, the Jefferson Bible, that has the teachings he loved, without the miracles he couldn't understand. The fact is, God's people still today, there's parts of the Bible we'd rather avoid. Parts, if we could say, I'd like to cut that verse out. It makes me uncomfortable. But we have to realize we're doing what Joseph's brothers did, and we're just trying to ignore the dream, to ignore the revelation from God that we have. Of course, then we see his father. And his father comes and in the back of his head, he says, I wonder if this is from God. And we, God's people, have to come in humility and say, God has spoken. 
and it may put us in place of repentance and forgiveness like it put, will put his family, Joseph's family, in a place of surrender and acknowledgement of his authority. But that's where we belong, is in humility before God. In fact, the story is told back in 1986, there was a, a musician, Daniel Towner. He was invited to be a special, uh, to provide special music at a revival services being held um, in Massachusetts. And the person holding the revival services was Dwight L. Moody. And Moody usually had, I think it was Ira Sankey was his usual musician. But somehow, um, somehow that Daniel Toner was invited. And one night they had testimonies. They didn't have a microphone. Nowadays we have microphones. When I was a kid, we'd set up a microphone and we'd, at, at Sunday evening service. I'd say, anybody got a testimony how God's working in your life? Some nights where nobody would show up and share a testimony, nobody would stand up. Other nights, a lot of people would stand up and share. There was always those people who stood up every time and shared the same testimony. 20 years later, you knew if you opened testimonies, they were going to stand up and share the same testimony and praise God for them. And, um, but we would have testimony time. Well, they had testimonies back in the 1800s. They just didn't have a microphone. and said, is God working in anybody's life? And a young man stood up. And when he stood up, he said this. He said, you know what? He said, I don't know if I can explain the Bible. He said, I don't know that I understand all of the Bible. He said, but I've determined tonight that when it comes to the Bible, I need to trust and obey the Bible. And the musician that was there heard that, and he thought, that's an interesting phrase, trust and obey. And he wrote it down, and he put it in a letter, and he mailed it off to a friend of his who was a preacher, the Reverend J.H. Samus. And J.H. Samus heard that, and he decided to build a lyric off it. And his lyric was this, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And that's our call with God's word. It is to take God's word and to trust and to obey it. We are called to humbly trust it and obey it. Not to hold it up in pride as better than anybody else, not to be angry and to avoid past parts that we don't like, but to humbly trust and obey. Now, it's interesting in the story, they all receive God's revelation. Joseph has the dream. He shares the dream with his brothers. His father hears about the dream. They all know what God has to say. The sad truth is this. Today, not everybody knows what God has to say in the Bible because the reality is this. Less and less of God's people read their Bible. So we don't know what God has to say because we're not in God's word as much. And so one of the implications is this. If we want to have God's revelation in our lives, we have to be people of the book. We have to be people who are in God's word. And I think the point that we see then in this passage is that we are to humbly let God's word lead our lives. Isn't that what's going to happen? God's word, his revelation in a dream is going to humbly lead Joseph into Egypt He's going to become a slave, but eventually he'll become the second, the right-hand man to Pharaoh. And eventually his brothers will come and bow down before him. And it's God's revelation that will ultimately lead and guide his life. And the same is true for us. We need to humbly let God's word lead our lives. But many of us don't. The sad truth is... Um, and so they say about 80% of people read the Bible, 80% of Christians, not people, 80% of Christians that go to church read the Bible every day. About 50% read the Bible regularly. About 50% of people in church don't read the Bible regularly. And so we're not necessarily engaging with God's revelation very often. And yet, it's interesting, the research says this, that I read an article, I went searching for it, it's a Lifeway Research Project, it came out earlier this year, but it said this, the best indicator of a person's spiritual health from all the indicators that they can tell is, is the regular reading of God's word. So that's the number one indicator of a person's spiritual health and walk with the Lord is reading the word of God. And it was interesting. I, I found this study back in 2016, Lifeway did a project. They discovered that the same is true for children. Lifeway Research found regular Bible reading as a child was the biggest factor in predicting the spiritual health of them as a young adult. That's interesting. I've never thought of that. Bible reading for youngsters is the number one predictor, they said. Now, I don't know if the research is right. I'm sure there's other research that might point to other things. But needless to say, 
reading God's word is important. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could do a survey of Gospel Center? And so I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know what, we can. You know, we can use a website like SurveyMonkey and send out an email to everyone. So I, I wrote a sticky note on my desk. I put it on there, and I've thought of doing this for months because I, I, I read that report months ago saying that Bible reading is the number one indicator of spiritual health. And I just wondered, I wondered how many people at Gospel Center are regularly reading God's Word? And I've, I've, I've dragged my feet about doing the survey, and I was like, and after working on the sermon, I'm like, oh, you know, it wouldn't be hard. We'll put it together. So I have a sticky note on my desk for Becca when she comes in on Tuesday to, to make a survey, and we'll send it out by email, and we'll do it totally anonymous so you don't have to embarrass yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to think like, oh, I read the Bible three times a week, but I'm going to put down five. That will look a little better, get me a higher grade with the pastor. I won't know. And, um, and, and I think any of us can admit that there's days we, we don't read Scripture, and all of us could probably read more Scripture the, but the question is, as a church family, are we in God's word? And so I thought, it only needs really three things. One is, I'm just curious of the age of people. You don't need to give me your names. You don't need to reveal how old you are. I wouldn't want to do that. That would make some of you uncomfortable. Some of you are proud of your age. Others of you, you're still 22, and you're going to be 23 next year. I know that, and I know that the following year, you're going to be 21. So that's okay. That's how the math works on the birthdays. That's great. I'm happy for you. And, um, but you don't have to give a name. Just your age. You know, what, what's your age? Just kind of see if there's any patterns there. Your age. The next one is, um, how many days a week do you read the Bible? How many days a week do you read the Bible? So just like days equals, do you read the Bible one day a week, zero days a week? Do you read it four, five, six, seven days a week? How many days a week on, on average do, would you say you read the Bible? And then the last question is, it's just simple yes or no question, do you have a Bible reading plan? Or do you just kind of open it up and say, here it is. And by reading the Bible, I mean the Bible. I, I love Our Daily Bread. I think it's a fantastic ministry. Um, they have wonderful teaching. Um, I've used a lot of their other resources too. But there's a difference between reading all devotionals and just reading the Bible. And I'm a fan of devotionals. Um, I enjoy having a partner when I read the Bible. But I also think there's a place for God's Word. And um, just do you have a plan for reading the Bible? Some people read the Bible through in a year. You know, maybe you've seen that you know, a Bible in the year uh, reading plan. Others read uh, just, they have a little thing where it's like 10 verses a day. Some people read just a chapter a day. They're working through it. Others, others just do snippets. They're like, oh, I'm on a 30-day plan to get through the Gospel of John. And then I'm going to sign up for another 30-day plan to get through, you know, the book of Deuteronomy. And they read it that way using version um, Bible reading plans. And so there's all different ways. I'm just curious, yes or no, you have a Bible reading plan. Uh, other people just open the Bible and they just like, they open it up, they point to a verse and it's Amos and it says, go to Bethel and sin, which the book of Amos does say, and it's one of the favorite Bible verses of this area, to go to Bethel and sin. And um, that's probably not the best way to read the Bible, but uh, I'm just curious of those things. In fact, you might be sitting there and saying, well, my hope is to send that out by email this week. Well, hopefully that will happen. But you might be saying, you might be sitting there saying, well, I don't have email. How can I do that? If you want to use a Connect card, you don't have to put your name on it. You can put age equals, put your age there. You could put um, days equals, how many days you read the Bible. You put that there. And then you can put Bible reading plan equals yes or no. Choose one or the other. And then as you walk out so nobody knows it's your answer, throw it on somebody else's table. Okay? And that way, you don't, that way you, they don't, you don't even have to let them know it was at your table. Nobody can tie it back to you. You just walk out, slip it on somebody else's table, and uh, we'll see the writing on it and collect it. But I'm just curious. If Bible engagement, engaging with God's revelation is the number one indicator of spiritual health, then we have to be taking God's word in. And when we take it in, we have to take it in humbly so that we realize our role in response to God's word is to trust and obey it. To trust God's word and to obey it. You might be thinking, well, pastor, how can I improve Bible reading? I came across a suggestion not too long ago, and I've seen Bible reading plans for years and different ways to mark the Bible and study your word, lots of things like that. But one thing I'd never heard of uh, until more recently was this. They said, never read the Bible alone. You might be thinking, well, what do you mean? It's personal devotions, isn't it? I'm reading the Bible, we call it devotional time with God. Isn't that personal? Yeah, that's great. I'm not telling you not to do that. Their encouragement is to never read it alone. In other words, they said, you're going to read the Bible, on, you know, read it on your own, spend time in prayer with God. Said, but, said a lot of people, when they're done with that, then they're done. 
said, learn to read the Bible with friends. In other words, say, say you want to read through the Bible in a year. Find four or five people who want to read through the Bible with you in a year. You do your daily devotions on your own, but maybe once every two weeks, get together with them to discuss what you've read through so that you are reading through Scripture knowing that there are others who are reading through the same passages of Scripture you are. You're on a Bible reading plan through the Gospel of John? Find four or five people who will read through it at the same pace you are. And then every now and then get together and say, okay, what made sense? What didn't make sense? What do you think Jesus means by this? And discuss it so that you're reading the Bible with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's just an, an, a piece of advice I heard um, as far as a way to engage with Scripture and to encourage us so that we're not reading the Bible just by ourselves. In this passage, we discover that we are to humbly let God's Word lead our lives. When I was in Mississippi um, at Day Spring Community Church, the pastor there, I stole it from him. You know, uh, before COVID, we'd have the kids come up front and we'd pray for them. And uh, put, I put my hand on their heads, and we have people reach out their hands. I stole that from my pastor in Mississippi. He doesn't care. Um, pastors are glad to share ideas and things. So I just like, oh, that's different. I'll do that. So, uh, so I've done it ever since we moved from Mississippi. But he used to sing a song. I have never sung this song. And uh, I'm like, I never heard this song growing up. And then my wife told me that he made it up. But he would sit up there. The kids would come up front. He'd put his hand on their heads. And as they're coming up front, he'd say, I like the Bible. I like the Bible. I read it and I do it. And he'd get every, all the kids to yell, I read it and I do it. I like the Bible. I like the Bible. I read it and I do it. And he would sing that. When we moved to Ohio, I've never, I've never done that song. They sang a different song there. And uh, I, some, some of you probably know it. For some reason, I didn't grow it learning up. But it was a cute little song that said, Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Any of you heard that song? Those of you at home, you can raise your hands. Sorry, I can't see it. But... Uh, Many of you have. Do you know there's another verse? Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And there's motions with it, you know, the growing and the shrinking, and they all go together. But what we discover is it's really true. All the research, everything points to that, and we discover all the way through history, God's people responding to God's revelation, and by his grace, he's given us the Bible. And so my encouragement to us as a church is let's be people of the book. Not just at church on Sunday morning, but let's be people of the book on Monday through Saturday as well. And let's let God's word shape and guide our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. It is your gift to us that we might know your truth. And Lord, there are parts that are hard to understand. Lord, we confess there are parts that are just, we get into Numbers and Leviticus and it just can seem boring. And we get lost in that. But Lord, may we encourage one another to be people of the book. And Lord, may your word mold and fashion us into the image and the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, may it do so humbly, not in pride, not in anger, but in humility, submitting to your word and your will in our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Will you stand up as we sing our closing song? How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, he is with us, so oh, be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand Upheld by his merciful almighty
a seat for a second. I don't know if uh, everyone realizes this, whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're watching at home, but today is the Murray's last Sunday with us. JP is playing the piano. Andrew is on the bass guitar. And his family is back here. And uh, they have been a blessing the Gospel Center for 20 years uh, that they have been here. And we have enjoyed their ministry to our church, and Amy's accepted a new position out in Colorado where she'll be serving two different hospitals um, under the same umbrella, I assume, there, and we're excited for her, but they are leaving today. So uh, church this morning, lunch, I believe, with family, and then on the road to California, and so um, we just want to pray for them and honor them. In the early service, we had a gift, and I told JP in the early service, I said, we since he plays the piano, the grand piano, we'd like to give him the piano, but we didn't think it'd fit in their car on the way, since they're leaving on the way. And the truth be told, we, um, we need it next Sunday. So, um, so I was trying to think, what, what could we get him? What would just be fun? And the, then I, I heard Pastor Ben say something um, over the months, and he's on vacation today and uh, next Sunday. But uh, he said this. He said, J.P., that he hasn't determined yet if JP is a pianist who plays like he's a drummer or if he's a drummer who happens to play the piano. Because in Pastor Ben's words, JP plays the snot out of those keys. And, um, and if you hear him play, I mean, he, uh, we have great pianists, other pianists in church, but they each have a different style. And uh, JP plays hard. So we decided to, uh, just for fun, to give him a set of drumsticks. And uh, some of the team signed those. So JP, if you'll come up here. And Andrew, I won't put you on the spot. I thought of getting you a guitar pick for a bass guitar because they come in real handy, I know. But, um, but we have something for the second service so that each service would be unique because there's something else you don't know about JP and Andrew, and that is there's piles. Actually, they do a pretty good job cleaning them up, but sometimes they pile up McDonald's bags back in the little computer room back there. Um, McDonald's gets good business from Gospel Center on Sunday mornings. And so uh, we just thought it'd be appropriate to send you away with a, uh, a, uh, a little gift card to McDonald's for you and Andrew as you drive to uh, California that you could at least get your Diet Coke. And I don't know what you drink when you go there, but, um, the, uh, but just a small gift card. It is a Christmas one because we can only go in the drive through and they don't give you a choice anymore inside. So <laughs> sorry about that. But um, we appreciate them. And... Um, you know, we do it with the kids. I will maintain social distance as best I can here. And, um, but I just encourage you, Amy and family are back there, and um, Andrew and JP are up here. Would you just reach out your hands as if you could put it on their shoulders? And can we just pray God's blessing as they go to California and uh, what God's going to do in and through their lives? Father, we thank you for the Murray family. Lord, they have been a blessing to Gospel Center. 
And Lord, it's, it's with a sad heart that uh, we say, see you later. And Lord, we look forward to the times when they can visit in the future. But Lord, we know that you could go with them. And we pray you will go with them and you will bless them in California. And Lord, that you will prepare the way before them and that you will make them a blessing in that place. And may the light of Jesus Christ shine brightly through them. Thank you for the blessing they have been and are to our church. And Lord, thank you for the blessing that you will make them and their new employments and new homes there. So Lord, go with them, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We stand up for the benediction. Thanks, JP. Thanks. May God's word shine where your feet should walk and light the path for your life all the days ahead. Amen? Amen. You are dismissed.